You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Eventually, through a series of uh, real brilliant moves, the people who were living in the house thought it would be a good idea if they ripped off this club owner uh, that had all this coke and heroin and money and all this stuff. The weak link in the pin here was uh, John Holmes, who was buying dope from them, friends with this guy up on the hill, and I, 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 they went and they ripped this guy up on the hill off. I went back and John Holmes then went back up to the guy on the hill, Eddie Nash, and told him that, uh, yeah, he was responsible. And Eddie Nash sent down his bodyguard, a bunch of other guys with a bunch of lead pipes. And they ended up bludgeoning to death everybody in the house. My guest, John Wakehorst, has been writing a terrific chronicle of the 1981 Wonderland murders that occurred in Laurel Canyon, California, also known as the Four on the Floor murders. It is one of the most grisly and famous unsolved murders. Welcome, John Wakehorst. Yeah, thanks. So what were the Wonderland or the Four on the Floor murders? The Four on the Floor Wonderland murders were an inside friend of a rich nightclub owner and restaurateur who was John Holmes. He ruined his marriage by cheating and whatnot. And he also lost custody of his kids. So he's just being a rundown cokehead, basically, and partying every day because he can't deal with that emotional side, I guess. So he's hanging around with all these losers. And uh, Holmes decided he would get some money back that he owed the gang at Wonderland, who were a bunch of low-level drug dealers, really. Several had criminal records, but then a few of them didn't, you know, so it was almost like everyone's family has some sort of dark person in there. At least they went to jail or something at one point. So it attracted attention when Eddie Nash, the nightclub owner, was robbed, and he quickly put two and two together that John Holmes, the porn star, had set him up because he had been there five times throughout the preceding day. So he's like, what was he doing? And they came in through the back. It must be the back door. And they checked, of course, the back door is unlocked. So he quickly wants to see Holmes. And then he gets Holmes to confess uh, that, yes, they were the ones that robbed him. And, you know, he wants, he's a man from an honor, cult, honor culture. It's kind of outdated to say nowadays, but in those days, it was a big deal to be the head of your flock, you know, and, and you take care of all your employees and they look up to you and, you know, to hold a gun in his mouth and demand he open his safe while he's crying, that's going to bring some kind of revenge you don't know about. You know, he's not just going to forget about this. So conveniently, he found Holmes, the main setup guy, and it was Holmes. So he made them hang around until they got some of their boys over there, and then they went. They couldn't use guns. It would have been too loud. So they went with some, like, pipes or blunt objects, maybe baseball bats. They had evidence of both being used from the bodies. And they murdered everyone in the house, and they thought they did. One of those girls survived. She was 29 years old, and she had only been there visiting. So anyway, there were four deaths and hardly any evidence left behind. And so... All the police could do was badger Holmes and Nash and try to get a, an angle in to get a prosecution going. And it was getting harder and harder because then they couldn't find Holmes and he had split town. But he was claiming he was afraid of the mafia and Nash was not in the mafia. He was just a rich guy that liked the party. He was the prototypical 70s nightclub owner, you know, the sunglasses, the different girl every night, the convertible Corvette. And he had a lot of friends, and he also did some little shady deals here and there. He had once run a brothel in Vegas and another time in L.A. for high-end clients. But he was tired. He had been arrested for that like twice in his past. So he quit doing all that kind of stuff. That just brought attention. 
And he just lived off his cash income from his bars and restaurants. He had like That was 20. my question because he's also been described as a drug dealer. That's true. He always was. So was he living off of his nightclubs or was his drug dealing just supporting his habit? Because he was also a drug user. So A little of both, actually. His clubs and restaurants, of course, back then were most a paper, you know, cash businesses. So he could take out cash and just underreport the earnings and uh, have plenty of cash every week from all of them. And uh, that way he didn't have to use any savings or uh, solely rely on selling drugs. But the drugs were all to friends. He had some real high-end dealers. You know, like he had the real slick guy from South Central. He's a black guy. He comes over. Then you have the girl who works at the beach bar he owns. She comes in for her, and she usually orders their filling for their friends. You know, they don't go up to strangers asking them if they want hard drugs, that kind of thing. So it's pretty tight business. You know, and in the service industry, it's just infested even today with that kind of uh, behavior and that kind of inside scoop on, oh, well, Julie, she's off today, but tomorrow you might be able to get some. You know, that's right. the kind of thing you would hear. Right. So he would sell through his restaurants and through his few intimates that he had that were real close. Mm-hmm. I mean, just saying you knew Nash didn't mean you were a friend. He's, he's acquainted with you. You can come over and have a beer or get high or bring something for him to sample, you know, if you wanted to. But don't expect anything because he was also really tight with money. So these girls who are thinking they're over there going to find their way in the industry for modeling or whatever were sorely mistaken because it was hard to get 10 bucks out of the guy. When that's how he got rich. He didn't spend a lot of money. Right. And he was portrayed in Boogie Nights. By Alfred Molina. What do you think of that portrayal? It's like dead on. I mean, they didn't arrest him in his his silk underwear or whatever. <laughs> right. But they, they let him put a, a jacket on and a, he had a button-up shirt. So I think during the day he would wear that. But at night he might, you know, sleep in something else or one of his girlfriends were over, whoever that might be. Uh, but I think that portrayal is really good. And the other one is kind of iffy, the Eric Bogosian for the 03 movie. Right. I didn't, I didn't, one that one just made him look like a psycho, <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. And he really wasn't. Until that robbery, he, he wasn't a psycho. He was Mr. Cool Guy. And only he had morals, though. He wouldn't let any kids under 18 smoke crack. So at least he had morals. There you go. He's got a code. <laughs> and yeah. So who is John Holmes? I mean, I realize probably most of my audience is too young to remember what was his life like at the time of the murders? For a good 10, 12 years, he was on top of his game. He had started a business, and he's a porn star, one of the few that transcended the silent movies up to the better quality sound movies. Because when he first started, he was doing silent loops, which were showed at adult newsstands or whatever. And you had a little booth you would go in, and it would just be little minute-long loops that would play it. And he started out doing that. Then he started getting more well-known as, as guys said, hey, who's that guy with the big business down there? Oh, that's a client of mine. I'll, I'll put him through to you. You know, and they do all that for word of mouth and for finder's fee, all that kind of stuff, just like regular showbiz, I guess. And so then he got popular playing these Bob Shin movies. Bob Shin was a porn producer back then. And there were these really bad detective movies. I <laughs> mean, even if they put millions into those and made them non-sexual, they, they would have been horrible. He played this detective called Johnny Wad, and that was his real claim to fame. And he was in some other types of porn movies, but that's what he became famous for because theaters wanted those because they drew people in, you know, the porn theaters. And they'd rather have him up there than some no-name guy. And uh, it's also a freak of nature kind of thing. Right. You know, with his uh, personal stuff. But in the late 70s, when he met his underage girlfriend, Dawn, who she plays out in the story later, or uh, he wasn't doing any drugs. He might have smoked weed and that was it. And he didn't really drink, you know, and he would go collect money for Save the Whales and she'd go with him. And they'd go camping a lot and all this. And well, by like 1978, he was hooked on Freebase. And she was there when it happened because several times he quit and broke his pipe and said, that's it. 
you know, I'm not, never doing this again, but it was like a bad sign of things to come, you know, like the, uh, like foreshadowing of what would become because he didn't stick to his promise to quit. And so he'd go buy another pipe and then start freebasing again. Oh, that's the drug that got him. Mm-hmm. He didn't get addicted really for snorting it. Some people can where they're just unruly and ir- like irresponsible. But his big thing was just doing free base and enjoying the euphoria of it and just sitting in a closet. He could sit in a closet for three days, you know, and he never would like do it and then go clubbing or whatever. Mm -hmm. For him, it was all about that self euphoria and that's all you care about. And then it's expensive, though, because there's another production aspect to making it and you, you have to do it right or you'll ruin it. So. It was hard to do it to begin with. It's easy to just go buy cocaine from some guy, but to make rock out of it um, is another scientific procedure, pretty much. So he got into that big time, and then slowly all of his money and all of his assets went out the window. Mm -hmm. And even his wife at the time, Sharon Holmes, even she felt it because he had maxed out all of her credit cards. He had stolen all of the appliances, stove, refrigerator. Everything. She came home one day from work to nothing there, hardly. Mm -hmm. Whatever he could get a dollar for, he had stolen it for his habit. And then she'd always take him back into her good graces, you know, as far as visiting. And all right, because she loved the guy. You know, she can't help it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with the underage girlfriend. She loved him. So the close people in his life stayed near him. But everyone else, once he screws you over and you don't know him, and he owes you a hundred bucks. You're like, fuck that guy. I'm not going to mess with him anymore. Sure. So he owed the Wonderland gang money. He owed Eddie Natch money. I mean, who didn't he owe money at the at the murders, right? I mean, he was really... Yeah. He exactly. couldn't work, he, really? Yeah, he couldn't work. He couldn't perform. And I guess when he sniffed the cocaine, he could perform it well enough. Because it wasn't a problem until the free base came into the scene when one of his co-stars found him in a closet just hitting the pipe and they're like we've been looking for you for three hours you know like it's, it's your turn and so yeah when he was sniffing it he did okay but yeah as far as owing everyone he owed everyone in town to the point where you know he had his fences or wherever we could go sell stuff to him or whatever but i'm sure none of the pawn shops wanted to see him anymore and of course he was stealing luggage from airports you know, right off the conveyor belt. And I guess back then you could have done that. I don't know. I just don't think you can do that anymore. So it started off as, you know, he owed the Wonderland gang money. He agreed to keep the door open. And of course, my favorite detail of this is that they were supposed to do it, but they were so doped up the Wonderland gang that they didn't get it together for a couple hours. Yeah. Like, you know, that even if they know that there's drugs and money there, they're just like, uh, they're on their own, <laughs> their own high tide. Yeah. So they mosey on over there at 8, 8 a.m. And um, yeah. do this robbery. You're right. You're right. Eddie Nash knows immediately who did it, pretty much. And so mm-hmm. the retaliation murder, when Holmes was wanted, he was also wanted on some computer theft. Do you know the details of that? Yes, for the computer theft. Uh, he would steal out of cars, too, and this is how this plays. He was picking up Dawn from a client at a condo down in Santa Monica or somewhere like that. Venice Beach, maybe. It was one of the beachside communities. So it was a nice condo area. He's picking up Dawn from doing a trick. And the cop pulls into the parking lot and is just scanning, you know, and looking around. Because it's a nice neighborhood. They have police. And that's all he was doing was just checking it out. Well, he sees how the girls are dressed. When they when they come out, it's right when he's looking around, this cop. And uh, he's just there by happenstance. You know, he's doing his rounds. And then he looks over and sees the car they're going towards. And it's John sitting there all scruffy and kind of worn out looking. And this is like a couple months before the murders. So uh, Holmes is picking her up. He wanted her to go hooked, but he'd get jealous and like beat on her when she did. And he's stupid and whatever. The cop sees how the girls are dressed. Right. But, you know, and then Holmes is sitting there all scruffy and dirty looking. And there's an old beat up Chevy Malibu, you know, with dents all in it and dirty, whatever. It was the old car Sharon had and he kind of commandeered it. He asked first if he could look in the trunk. And Holmes says yes. And the computer is sitting right there in the trunk. He had just stolen it. 
So I don't know if, if the people called the stolen computer in. It could have been that, too. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he says yes, knowing he's going to get busted. And then they all get arrested, and Nash had to bail them out the next morning. They were that close, he and Nash, that Nash would bail them out. So, you know, especially on a small bond like that, it's probably a couple hundred bucks. So anyway, they released the girls, no charges. But Holmes got a charge on it. Mm-hmm. And so right about the time he was going to have to go to court for that, of course, he was a no-show. That was when he got arrested in Florida when he fled because he was scared of the police. He wasn't afraid of Eddie Nash. In the late 70s, he met Nash and the Wonderland Gang around the same time frame. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it was like spring or fall of 78. And then, you know, within two years, the Wonderland Gang was pretty much sick of him. His novelty had worn off you know, introducing him and being interested or acting like you are in the conversation with this porn star guy. They're just tired of him. He never brought anything to the party table. No money, no drugs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes he would share a little bit with you, but they're drug dealers. They usually have their own. Mm -hmm. And and he's also a talkative fella. So you get tired of his mouth running the whole time he's over there, I guess. That's what one of the children of one of the gang who was murdered told me. He had already known about Holmes from his dad telling him because he was an, a young adult back then. When Holmes died, I was in high school, and I remember hearing about it in the hallway, but I didn't know who he was. I just knew the name and the reputation because that was like a joke among kids. I don't know. All I knew was that he was a porn star that was well-endowed, and we right. giggle about That's it. That's so cool. well-endowed. I mean, there was no really equivalent, you know, today or no. ever to John uh-uh. Holmes. Like, you say John Holmes, and I mean, it's immediately like, I think it was something like a 13-inch penis, something like that. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about, like, oh, a big porn star. Like, freakishly <laughs> large. And one of the things that came up in my research was that the Wonderland gang had him pull out his penis. I mean, he didn't bring anything to the table. He didn't bring any drugs. He said they did make him pull out mm-hmm. his penis like a freak show at, a, at parties because it was the curiosity is just too much. I mean, and that would have bugged me. I wouldn't want to see anyone's penis at a party. But <laughs> uh, I think Don made that story up about him having to show his penis. Or he told her that. Oh, it's not its not a true story, huh? No, because the guys at the Wonderland house were as macho as you can get. Mm-hmm. They don't want some other guy upstage in them. And they always had women over there. That's and they, they're not anywhere near curious. Mm-hmm. And so I think Holmes told Don that to get her feeling sorry for him. Like, they beat me up. And like that happened a couple of times where Ron Lanius, who was the nicest of the Wonderland gang to him, because they had a few things in common at a personal level, their backgrounds and stuff like that. But Lanius was his best friend there at the house. The other two guys hated him. Uh, the main house occupant, Billy DeVarell, hated his guts. He wanted him out from day one. And not because he was a freeloader or anything. A lot of people come freeload and crouch on your couch when they're high or whatever. But Holmes, he was just sick of him. He knew what he was about from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And Billy B. Burrell was a working man until recently when he was on disability. And that's how he got involved in the criminal world through his girlfriend's buddies, her dealers and the thieves that she knew. Mm-hmm. And so the Wonderland gang you can talk about forever. They had all kinds of crazy adventures before they were murdered. And it's very sad that they were murdered because everyone in America was thinking this could be my son or my uncle. So it could happen to anyone was the moral to the story. And that's why America got so freaked out about it. Oh, that's interesting. And one of the things that also was so interesting about the actual robbery of Nash is in your blog, you talk about them putting liquid Band-Aid on their fingers so that they wouldn't leave a fingerprint. Obviously, John Holmes left a huge palm print on the headboard, um, one of the rooms. But so it had this kind of criminal sophistication, but it was so stupid to try to rob any Nash, you know? It's like at one part of it is very criminally sophisticated. Guess what was running through my head reading about it is how did they think they would get away with it? It was it a suicide mission? Was it just sort of like the drug user's mentality to not think about tomorrow, to just be high today? Yeah, I think it was a, a bit of that last one mixed in with some macho some machismo and and that they were all going to move away right away that went out the window as soon as they all got high and realized they were back home and they had the locked gate around their whole house 
Well, that's not going to keep out everybody. I don't know why they thought that was the best way to protect themselves. I would have been driving eastward for days <laughs> just because of the Holmes thing. Mm -hmm. And they had to have known that the Holmes thing would bring heat, mm -hmm. you know. And even the driver, Tracy McCourt, the youngest of the gang, mm -hmm. he was about 30 at the time. He was scared sitting on the patio and having a cigarette because he thought he saw Nash's car go by. And that freaked him out. He called a cab and got out of there and went to his other friend's house. And that's why he survived. He survived. He, he was around. one of the smartest ones. I was also surprised at how many people believe that John Holmes didn't do anything and that he just watched the murder happen, you know? Yeah. Why do you think people are so believe that? I mean... I know, like he just was there and had to stand against the wall and watch. <laughs> that's what he told them. I think they would have made him participate to get his hands dirty. Of course they did. I mean, you just think about, if you're Eddie Nash, what's the ultimate punishment if you don't want to kill someone? Make them go and kill your friend, you know? Yeah, something horrible like that. Right. I mean, he's covered in blood. His wife talks about how John Holmes is covered in blood. It just seems so obvious to me. Yet, how did he get acquitted? How did he convince a jury that he was the victim? Yeah, well, they didn't think he was squeaky clean. It took three days to deliberate that trial. And there were a few that were going, hey, no, there's no way, you know, this guy, he's guilty. It was like nine to three for not guilty. So over three days, they convinced the other couple that this is how it's got to be because of the stipulation the judge threw at us. What was the stipulation? Oh, that you can't convict him just because he was there while they killed them. There was no evidence no blood evidence, no weapon evidence, no footprints. There was the handprint in the bedroom, but what that was was when Holmes stayed there. You could tell it was from moving the bed mm -hmm. and uh, or getting into bed, mm -hmm. and uh, that had blood running over it. So it wasn't like a bloody handprint, like this is a killer, you know. It was just an old handprint from months ago when he used to stay in that room. That's like the jury will be like, oh, well, we can't convict him on that because he used to stay in that room. And so then the blood also was just blood that dribbled down over the old handprint, which is what uh, Holmes's attorney told me. His name is Mitchell Eggers. He's a real nice guy, but they didn't think he was real squeaky clean. They didn't like that man, but they couldn't convict him just on that. And they also didn't think he was innocent, but there had to be more to give someone the death penalty. This is a death penalty case. And his trial transcripts are missing, right? Or the one copy, right, that his defense attorney has? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly true. And then the other Nash trials, those are missing also. <laughs> and so whether the clerk just is lazy and won't go look, or if some big prosecutor needs it, I bet it would be found then. I just think in general, civil servants aren't going to go out of their way to help you anymore, not like they used to. I just think it's that. But you want to see a, a big flip on that would be during Nash's second trial for the murders, because he was a hung jury on the first trial. So they took him to trial again within a year. The hung jury, they thought he was the greatest person ever, Nash. And, oh, this, we want this other guy to go on trial next. Because the defense found their proper red herring, which is a phone recording of some loudmouth drug guy saying he had killed him. Uh -huh. You know, he told his girlfriend that. So the, the quotes I read from the, the other jurors in the paper about the Nash trial to the opposite of Holmes was that we think he was railroaded and they, it just added to all the controversy. It's like, oh, no, because <laughs> then you influence people's opinions of Nash saying he's this great guy. But they really had no evidence to say Nash ordered the murders. It's not like the guys were caught there at the house and had to drop their weapons, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. There was no evidence putting any, Nash or any of his boys at the house. And so it was just circumstantial because of what happened. And that's usually not enough to give someone the death penalty. Also, the way those cases work, Roberta, is even today, if they do it this way, you either get convicted of first-degree murder and are given the, the lengthiest or deadliest sentence, or there's nothing. There's no, oh, you can also do third-degree murder. You can only do, I think, one in, in the indictment. You know, different types of punishment. Because the sentencing is a whole nother phase. Sure. And so, in a lot of states, doesn't have the power to say, well, let's go with third-degree murder. I'll go ahead and let y'all do that if you want. They don't do that. Right. It's either the, the big charge, mm -hmm. and that's all you get. That's a good point. 
And so when you think about it, because L.A. or California quit putting people to death after 06. Mm -hmm. And so some of the guys that have still been in there, like Sirhan, Sirhan is still hanging around. And just crazy how long some of them have been on death row. And now Scott Peterson, he's on death row and he's living the good life. You know, they get better treatment and more free time. Time, right. You get your own cell and, and your own TV is what I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but then in 2000, they indicted Nash on RICO charges. They couldn't bring in not exactly the murders because he had been acquitted uh -huh. of that, but the fact that he had retrieved the property. And I just wanted to insert right here that little clip. His uh, lawyer, lawyer. Nash's lawyer, Ray, talking about what he pled to. I want to switch gears and talk to you about the Wonderland murders. Now, you did, represented Eddie Nash, who was a, a former nightclub owner. He had been charged uh, with I the 1981 Wonderland murders. He was sentenced to 37 months in federal prison. What happened is four people were murdered. It also involved the ex-porn star John Holmes. Historically, you have to understand there were two things that happened before that case that you're talking about was brought. One, he was charged with a federal offense having to do with burning, burning down a bunch of buildings that I represented him on. He gets acquitted of that, which is during this whole period of time. He was pretty this, Teflon. He got acquitted of the murders, too. Then he was tried for the murders, and he was acquitted of the actual murders. All right. Then what happened is that he gets indicted in federal court on a RICO, racketeering. Or, and now, RICO allows them to go back to the beginning of time, actually to the time that the RICO statute was enacted, to be able to pick up what they call predicate acts, other offenses as part of the RICO. So they went all the way back and they were picking up every bit of garbage they could find and included within that was the Wonderland murders. Clearly he'd been acquitted of the murders, we weren't going to plead him to anything having to do with the murders, but we, we wound up uh, settling the case for a sentence that was probably reasonably appropriate under the circumstances. What happened immediately after the sentencing was that the prosecutor went outside and said, he admitted the murders. Well, he, he didn't admit the murders. And I guess that's where the report comes from the L.A. Times, that he was running around saying he admitted the murders. He never admitted the murders. Eddie indicated, or in the, in the plea agreement, acknowledged that he had been robbed. They had taken money and drugs from him. He had, high, he had gotten some people to see if he could find out who had taken the money and drugs from him, and they never did anything. They never got, were able to succeed. So he, he admitted that portion of it. But he specifically denied that he had, he had anything to do with the murders, that his people ever murdered anybody or were supposed to murder anybody. Yeah, so the prosecutor then says he admitted the murders. Well, he didn't. He simply did not admit the murders. The charging document, the whole charging process, was motivated by the publicity because finally somebody was going to get him for the Laurel Canyon murders that he'd already been acquitted of. And during the course of the Laurel Canyon murders prosecution itself, they were able to pretty convincingly demonstrate that somebody else was responsible for those murders, and that's why Eddie was acquitted of them. So to put this man through this kind of trauma all over again with regard to something he already gone through once really was totally inappropriate and it was overreaching. But Eddie never admitted those murders. I don't think Eddie committed the murders. I think they proved who did. What do you think of that? Oh, I like that clip, but of course, he's a loyal lawyer. You know, he's going to be on your side till the end. So, of course, <laughs> he's got his slanted view. And Donald Ray is a little more polished and has a better reputation. But it would be like asking Johnny Cochran to come in there and talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. he's, of course, going to say his client's innocent and it was all a big railroad. By also, Roberta, by the late 90s, the drug laws and a lot of other laws had strengthened. Yes. So they could actually make charges stick now. And so what they did, they probably wrote down on paper. Uh, this is after talking to Holmes' lawyer. They probably offered the plea deal on a piece of scratch paper or verbally. They said, that's your client's only option for a plea deal unless you want to go to trial. And it's not looking good, you know, with all the other stuff we got on him. Because he was also acquitted of arson charges right. in the early 80s as well. Mm -hmm. So he was pretty tough on and this is what angered Nash and his family so much is that he was already cleaned his life up and was back to being a grandpa and stuff. He wasn't even a part of that world at all. He had a younger girlfriend and she kind of took care of him. What made them want to indict him 10 years later? I mean, Oh, the, uh, they had to get him with these Armenian brothers that came over in the late 70s mm -hmm. who were big troublemakers and big mafia. They, they wanted to be known as the mafia. They didn't want to hide behind the, the surface like Nash and just be high all the time. They wanted to be known as the godfathers of the mafia in L.A. 
And the, the mafia in LA does not have a great track record because they always get beat up or kicked out of town. Because uh-huh. the police there just don't tolerate that stuff. If you're out extorting businesses, they're going to be on your butt right away. It was these two Armenian brothers, and uh, that's who they really wanted, I think. But they go, let's throw Nash and Holmes in there too. And they threw Greg Dials in there. So it was Nash, his bodyguard, who had died, and Holmes is dead. But the only other two people living on that document were the Armenian brothers. Their last name is Michaelian. Very hard to spell. But one is Joseph, and the other one was Randy. Those are the translated first names, so I just think that's funny. The godfathers (laughs) of L.A., Joseph and Randy. Yeah, you need a better name. (laughs) Yeah, so they had a bunch of scams. They ran taxis, a taxi company. They did all the mafia kind of stuff. They owned a gas station. Well, then they got involved in ripping off fuel supply companies by not paying the sales tax for the gas they bought. Uh-huh. It's called a long firm fraud. It's when you run a business long enough to get a couple hundred grand out of it, and then you dump it and just disappear. Uh-huh. And see, nowadays you need more credentials to open a business. You can't just do it and hide behind a corporation name. Sure. You have to have a social security number of someone who's clean, who's going to be there during audits by the IRS and all this stuff. So. Just because I'm an accountant, and I know just by working that that's what happens. Uh They want to make sure a real person is behind this business, so if they don't pay their sales tax, because, you know, every month, most companies have to pay it that way, your sales tax to the government, every Mm -hmm. month. Oh, that's interesting. And they'll be looking for you. Yeah, they'll be looking for you if you don't. But back then, I guess they were a little more lax, Uh because that was the, the whole fraud, was you buy gasoline at 85 cents a gallon, whatever it was, and you sell it for like 95 or whatever you can get. And then that's all profit right there, that 20 cents. You don't pay sales tax on it. So sales tax would have been for gas. I think it would be a little extra because it's fuel and there's different laws about taxing fuel. Mm-hmm. And so even with a, say, a small convenience store, you could do pretty well in a month from not turning in your sales tax money. Mm-hmm. They had gotten pretty big by the early 90s, and they were bringing in prostitutes from Eastern Europe, and there were some turning up dead. Yep. There was a lot of those type of guys, though. They weren't the only ones. So all of the guys with a little money from over there came over here to, like, you know, soak up the spoils or whatever and because we were so, our laws had been so lenient for so long. And they were also real rough guys. They could be real sweet, you know, like the mafia boss, but next thing you know, you have cement shoes on mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. At least one of them still lives in a, like a West Hollywood neighborhood, older but nice neighborhood, you know, uh, smaller homes. I tracked them down to one of the brothers to there. And so. Did they do any time? Oh, yeah. They both got nailed. They wanted Nash in there, too. They were like, let's just build this list up. And they put Holmes in there to make it look like, okay, so we really did solve the murders. But really, they had no legal uh, reason for doing that other than payback. This is after Holmes is dead. And Greg Dials was dead, too. Right. Nash's driver and a bodyguard. But And see, the other thing about the killings of the Wonderland gang is uh-huh. they could get very racial. And Dials was a black guy. And he did not like being called those names. And so he wanted personal revenge. Oh, interesting. And of what they did, they also shot him or, or grazed him in the back with an accidental gunshot. Right. And from where I, where he grew up in uh, Oakland, before he ended up in L.A., and it was in a very racial area or borderline to a really racial area with a lot of racism and violence. Mm-hmm. And that's where he and his younger brother grew up. I think he had an older sister, too. But then they all moved for their mom's job or something. They moved down to L.A. And they lived in a nice area off of Crenshaw. It's like a duplex, you know, nice looking and nice cars around there. It's not like a maybe a night. If you're a white guy, you don't want to be walking around there. But there's no problem there. Mm-hmm. Uh, South Central still has nice neighborhoods. It's, it's not all been destroyed by the O.J. thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's where his mom, his sister and his brother lived. You know, it's like, why pay rent on an apartment or something when I could just stay with mom? And so that's what a lot of people do. And uh, that's where he was. But, yeah, they had three others or two others that they wanted besides Dials and Holmes, who were obviously dead. And uh, they wanted Nash. Uh, but for the things they wanted Nash on, he had already beat the rap on two of them. So I don't know what of the five bullet points that were in the plea deal. 
I think they were just trying to mess with him some more. The 90s were pretty quiet, but when that indictment came down about the RICO stuff and the two Armenian brothers were included, along with Dallas and Holmes, Nash had been on vacation in China. So that must have been a terrible plane ride home, knowing you're going to get handcuffed at the airport. Oh, you know? definitely. And, so, yeah. and he got no bail. He was locked away and, uh, of course, no interviews, nothing like that. Yeah, Donald Ray is like having to do all this stuff for him to keep him sane in there. And to, like, get him to be able to see his two boys. He had a daughter. But in a way, I just think that was the prosecutors. They can play dirty, too. And not that it would have gotten through the judge, this double jeopardy business. But they could bring up additional things that Mm -hmm. they think he was involved in. So you're not acquitted of all murders. Just you'd only be double jeopardy on that one murder you were tried for. So they were just adding stuff to it. So how does Scott Thorson, he was a witness at one of Nash's earlier trials before the indictment came down. This Scott Thorson Liberace's ex-lover, <laughs> yeah. how does he get into the mix here? Just like Holmes, he had met Nash through another nightclub owner who would take him over there to visit or to buy coke or whatever while they're out partying or whatnot. And that's how they met Nash, both Holmes and Thorson. But Thorson knew him since the Mm mid-70s when he was still with Liberace. Then when things got bad with Liberace and Thorson, he got kicked out. The Nash gang, uh, Liberace's gang, and the security guards at the building where Liberace's nice condo is or whatever, they had a Mexican standoff out there because Nash and Chris Cox, the other nightclub owner, said, hey, send some boys over there to help Scott. He's under duress and getting uh, robbed or something. So they all show up with heaters. And then the security guard was there going, hey, you guys take it easy. You know, he's being kicked out. Here's the the paperwork on it. And they're like, oh, okay. Oh, they loaded up his clothes and drove him back to Nash's house. But uh, Nash, he knew how to hire some goons. These were scary guys. They were private detectives. But, yeah, they didn't take any crap. You know, even Liberace has some muscle behind him, you know, as far as. (laughs) Uh, doing the dirty work, you know, the dirty work involved. And then to do that to your former partner is kind of weak. But I guess Scott had pushed him to the edge with the drug use. Well, Liberace was also partaking quite a bit of more drugs than, uh, you know, according to (laughs) Scott. You know, a lot of really, a lot of drug use, too. Uh, Just he could handle it, you know, a lot better than uh, Scott Thorson could. He had been a a drinker his whole life also. Mm -hmm. So... He could have those three drinks and then go out on stage and kick ass. Mm -hmm. But like Scott, you know, had never really drank or done anything until he was 19 or whenever he met Liberace. Young. He met him young. I think, wasn't he 16 or 17? or? Uh, Well, that's what Scott says Uh to bring sympathy for him. Uh But I think Scott was born, when you look at his date of birth, it's not anywhere near. That would have had to be the late 60s. You know, when he met him, if that was the case. So that's another thing where Scott, there's that old saying, when the legend becomes fact, Prince of Legends. Sure. Because nobody wants to hear about that crap that you found the truth out, you know. And so that's a case of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found a lot of that in the, and like you have with all these cases where these uh, groups are getting guilty people kicked out of jail or whatever. Yeah. Um, A lot of that revising of history and self-aggrandizement. And that's why uh, a couple of people I've talked to over the years, not with this case even, but they try to polish up their own self-image or whatever, whether anyone believes them or not. They can convince themselves. Well, it makes them a total victim because, you know, if you're underage, (laughs) you don't know anything, you're so unworldly, you're under the Uh control of this powerful man who's giving you plastic surgery. I mean, it really makes (laughs) him look like a victim. Yeah, it really does. Right? That's so interesting. Because I also noticed with Scott Thorson, you know, right before he went to prison this time, um, he was really milking the public. Oh, I have cancer. (laughs) And, and, which is mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah. His description of what that credit card fraud that he w- had did time for didn't yeah. really make a lot of sense. Oh, I was holding no, my friend's no. credit card, and I was like, uh, I, I don't think the public yeah. should be sending this guy money. Was my thought. Of, when you talk about him changing his age, that does make of one piece. It is consistent with him. It changes the whole picture. You know, that the bodyguards beat him up at the condo, and he said that before, too. 
in his own book. It's like they didn't beat you up. They just drug you out of there because you refused to leave someone else's house. They didn't call the police. They could have called the cops, but they didn't do that. They just wanted him out of there. The reason is, is because there was some award show that night, the Grammys or something, and Liberace was going to play movie songs during one part of it for like 15 minutes. And uh, he was in town and flying in, and he had his two new French boyfriends with him. So he had to stay there and had a hot tub, you know, it would have been party time. And so that's why it was so urgent they get Scott out of that condo at the time. But yeah, Scott is so interesting in other ways, like, I've known a few people like this where they burn through several windfalls in their lives, which mm-hmm. would have either got them a nice house or something more beneficial than just spending it on drugs or on toys. Well, Scott, he burned through his Liberace money and all the vehicles, the three vehicles Liberace gave him. One was a Rolls Royce. And wasn't part of the deal like his dogs worth $20,000? Yeah, and he got the dogs. And I don't know what became of them. That would be something to ask Scott. It might be in his book. I have to look. I have to poke through there. That's a good question. And he got dogs and then some clothing. Liberace had him uh, nice clothes made, like probably tailor made stuff. So that could be worth some money, especially at a, on a personal level. Mm-hmm. And but one of the vehicles Liberace gave him was just like a van that his maintenance guy used at the mansion. Uh-huh. So you give them this pretty nice van, you know, but it's not fancy. It's not a custom van or anything. It's just like a, like a work van, a pervert van. He blew through that money. Then he blew through his book money because his book was quite popular in 86, I think, when it came out. I remember seeing it on the stand at an Eckerd Drugs. Right. And, I, you know, they used to have those things. And he blew that money, which was probably six figures, I would think. Wow. And he had a co-writer with him. Not a ghostwriter, but a co-writer. So it's a really good book and tells a good story. Most of it, I can only pick out small lies, you know, here and there. But for the most part, you can't really trust what he says about Liberace because he's mad about the whole thing still. I don't know. I don't like when things happen like that because he never paints himself bad at all. Right, never takes any responsibility for his own. Yeah, he never got drunk and fell off you know, the chair or something stupid. <laughs> Everything, he's just, he's trying to save an orphan or he's trying to save dogs or something. Everything, every time he's doing something. Right. And like in the movie, they show him working at the UPS store or whatever, uh-huh. the delivery store. And in real life, that came way later. Way when later. he had sobered up. Sure. Yeah, when he had sobered up. And it was right before his jail sentence. Because he got put in jail because, of course, the next windfall to come was uh, the one that he's in jail for, uh, the next windfall was when that movie came out. Sure. With Michael Douglas. So he got either 125 or 150 grand just to sign on the line. And they asked him to be an executive, like a, a consultant on the movie. Mm-hmm. So he probably did a few hours of work every day while they're making it and all this. And they found a lot of the old recording or the old uh, residential areas, like houses of Liberace actually lived in, like that condo. Mm -hmm. He blew through that windfall, according to his old neighbor in Palm Springs, he blew through that in like four months. Yeah. In between all this, he managed to get shot by a crackhead in Florida. Right. So the way he tells it, he says that was part of Eddie Nash's, that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, I thought I heard him, am I wrong that I thought I was under the impression that I heard an interview where he said it was revenge for testifying against Eddie Nash? Yes, and that couldn't be further from the truth because Nash had cleaned up. He wasn't dealing with people like that for the most part anymore, unless they were friends of his girlfriend, and she's Armenian. Mm -hmm. So if he didn't have someone coming over, it was his friends. He wouldn't have ordered a killing or anything like that. But uh, when you look at Scott, that was at the end. He was at the end of his book money, and he was staying at a rundown motel in Jacksonville. And it, the shooter uh, was a young black guy who just figured, hey, this idiot's sitting here with cash and drugs. He shoots him and all the stuff and leaves. And so for that to turn into five armed hitmen, you know, coming in and all that, because the police knew who the guy was, and they mm-hmm. found him with the murder weapon. So Scott, the killer, was found with the murder weapon, or the weapon you were shot with. And uh, he had prints all over the room. It was just a drug killing over greed. 
and uh, what he wanted Scott's two hundred dollars or whatever he had on him. But he barely survived that. The cops were amazed in Florida. They were like, you know, he just kept living and living. The next wow. thing I know, he's awake. He's awake and sitting up talking. Um, usually a couple shots to the chest, which was twice in the book and the new afterword of his book, which was re-released upon the movie release. He gets shot five times. So he even <laughs> bounced that up from two to five. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Yeah. The most amazing thing uh, about Liberace, it's just, he's just such an interesting, uh, again, like John Holmes, there is no equal, again, even the, the minor figures in his life, like Scott Thorson, are so interesting. We've just, you know, talked a, a yeah. long time of, of, about him. So talking about Scott Thorson's injuries, there was one person who survived the Wonderland murders, and she did testify in the preliminary trial. I was reading, is her first name Susan Launius? Is that my... Yeah. Right. Yes. And I was reading her testimony, and it, it just seemed like she lost a finger. She lost part of her skull. Looks like tremendous mm-hmm. brain damage. She could barely remember it. Was she any help to either the prosecution or the defense with her testimony? Only in establishing part of the timeline, because she could remember when she got there and stuff that day. She had been in the house less than 24 hours. But yes, the other stuff, it was not helpful at all. She thought she saw shadows, and then one guy had beady brown eyes. But they would have been asleep in the dark, so she didn't see anyone with beady brown eyes. <laughs> that could just be, you know, the way your brain works when you're unconscious. I don't know. Um, she remembers when the paramedics came in and that kind of thing. Uh, but, yeah, not much else. And But that's that's all it really did was add more another witness to the docket. It wasn't that helpful. It did show that there was a crime here, and this person survived. And it was kind of an FYI witness, you know, like, oh, by the way, there's another witness who was there, and it didn't do much for the jury. You can see, you can read in the testimony just how frustrated they're getting. Are you saying you're not wearing clothes in this picture where you're wearing clothes, clearly wearing clothes, you know? It's just very odd. Um, I, I felt very sad for her. And uh, yeah. how long did she, she's no longer living, is she? Uh, I thought she was. Oh, she is. Last time I checked, like five years ago, she still is, but. They don't have any contact with any outside people, you know. It's weird in this case because most of the children I found, a few of them hung up on me because it was their dad who never had anything to do with them. So they could give a shit. I might have upset them a little bit, but like Susan was there only because Ron wanted to get her back, Mm -hmm. you know, to be man and wife again. And they had been separated. And so he, that dumbass, he knows there could be some heat coming. He invites his wife over to the drug house and nearly gets her killed and changes her life dramatically. So I have, yeah, I feel real sympathy for her too. Yeah, I do. She was like one of the only people that didn't have uh, needle marks on her body. Also. Interesting. She was the only person. Yeah. Even the new girl, Barbara, who was killed on the couch, even she had uh, needle marks because she probably tried it or something, you know, and just, they just get high and sit there and watch TV, whatever they do over there. So even that 22-year-old girl had done the hardcore drugs that Susan didn't. And that, that's probably why she left him, was because of the drugs. And because he has money now, he took about 35 grand cash. That was his share. They really screwed Holmes and the driver guy over. But that's what criminals will do. Sure. And even if they're your friends, you know, the three guys, Ron, David, and, and Billy... They all took home about 33000 plus they split the remaining 12000 with the other two guys. So the other two guys got like 3000 and then Ron and the other guys got the other 9000 or whatever it was. So they really screwed them over, and that's long-time money, what they call it in the criminal world, mm-hmm. where you don't have to worry about working for several years if you, don't, if you keep if it you under control. If you don't have a drug habit, yeah. Yeah, and if you can clean up. Because they didn't even talk about where they were going to go. They don't talk to the media or people like me. But the children of one of the victims said she just threw this in to some other reporter who was, she was berating for calling her. She's like, my mother was planning shortly to retire to Hawaii. And that was like one of the other guys had said. So they were planning to go away, but they never got around to it because they got so freaking high. 
that after the robbery that they couldn't like hardly move or whatever. But I always felt sorry for Susan. But after, from what I found, I don't want to like spread personal information, but just really nice person and church going and had two daughters who both went to college. So she, for what it's worth, you know, she had such a great turnaround in life and she married a doctor. And so that was good to read because I would hate for her to have to go back to some kind of skeptical lifestyle or not that she ever was. Her parents owned a restaurant there in Olivehurst. She worked there as like an assistant manager. It was like a diner. And then I don't know if Ron ever worked there, but the address he gave on his license, driver's license, when he was killed was her parents' address. So I was like, oh, he's one of those guys. He gets out of prison and then the, they let him move right in. And it's like, she was just sick of his drug use and finally left him. Left him. Or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, she got a job as a secretary down in... uh I think it was Riverside, somewhere east of L.A., but a big enough area. Uh, she got a job there with a, working with a friend of hers. Or it might have been Sun Valley or Sunland. But anyway, it's a nice part of L.A. Like, I think it was pretty close to Glendale. And she was working there, and that's where Ron picked her up from. I don't think she flew in on the red eye or anything like that. I think she was actually working and living over there with her friend, doing uh, office work. Which is great. You know, that's what you want them to do. Get a job. And so I was like proud of her for that because she's the only one that had any kind of gainful employment of all the gang. Mm-hmm. You know, and then she gets almost killed. So. Terrible. Right. Exact. Wrong place. Wrong time. This murders, some people have said, um, signaled the end of the 70s. Yes. Yes. Do you uh, agree with that or and why so? This was eye-opening because they passed it on as these are just regular people who were murdered. And it's like, no, they weren't. A few of them were innocent, like Susan, but they got paid back for what they had done. You know, and I think it would even happen today Mm -hmm. if uh, the same scenario went down and you got a Nash type of guy. You know, he's going to want revenge. Right. And revenge is something that's eternal and there will always be revenge. Yeah. And so I think in a way... It woke people's eyes up to what was coming in the 80s. Now, it would get worse throughout the 80s, kind of a precursor. It was like, okay, don't fall asleep. There's more coming. You know, then you had all those crazy cop shows on, like Houston Under Siege, and they would show all these crack cocaine busts around town and stuff like that. It was kind of like an early version of cops. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, then you had cops and all those shows like that, and then all the other kind of... uh, then court TV came into play. Everyone wanted to see what's going on with such and such criminal. And But I don't think it ended the 70s because the 70s had exploding murder rates. And they could only come down after like 1980, 81. It got real bad out in California, especially until like 85 when they started getting new legislation in mm-hmm. to, to lock these people up you know no more raping and killing and then only getting three years like the dating game killer you know and it's like that's ridiculous like who are they they're the real criminals too the legislature for not having more of a penalty on some terrible crime like that there was a little bit of everyone to blame and also there were short jail terms for being a major drug dealer like nash and his drug conviction after the murders in like 82 83, he was uh, he was found guilty and the judge maxed him out eight years. But that isn't the norm. The legal norm at that time in, in California was two or three years. So he was going to be let out anyway when they filed their other petition to let him out on medical grounds. Mm-hmm. For someone who's dying, he sure lived a long time. Sure did, yes. So, yeah, it was like a combination of all those things. And also California had to release people all the time because they didn't have enough prisons. Well, that changed, too. They built, like, more prisons than China or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if you went on a tour, there's a lot of backwoods areas of California out in the middle of nowhere. And they had plenty of places to choose to put these prisons. So um, they had to start a a building boom that that will never be surpassed in the whole world. That's how bad it was. Not just the drug killings, but all the other murders, you know, from gang members to armed robberies to whatever. And, uh, yeah, that's just ridiculous that people didn't do more time back then. But 
John, where can people find you? Oh, my blog at wonderland1981.com. It's an excellent blog. I've really enjoyed um, reading it. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you so much for talking to me about this stuff. It's it's a fascinating uh, story and fascinating character. Yeah. yeah, it really is. And I hope we touched on all the big things you wanted to discuss. Thank you so much.